So this is December 2018, only a few days after Christmas, and lots of people probably got some fancy new Internet of Thing device that may or may not be secure, so maybe you don't want it on your network. But I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So there's always a lot of questions of do I or don't I put on the network? What should I have on my network or what should go on some type of separate segregated network? So these devices that if they get attacked or if the refrigerator gets compromised, uh, it doesn't become an attack vector for your other devices. I just want to do this quick video to talk about how you can separate them on a network, why you should or shouldn't, and things you can do to make them still function despite them being on a separate network. So I drew a diagram. What we've done here is, uh, this is essentially kind of a microcosm of a piece of our network broken out here, so you can see how the devices are set up. So the orange here is the 192.168.3 network where I have uh, the Unify switch, my computer, several other computers, phones, and things like that. This is more or less the trusted network per se. Then we have the 172 network here that has internet only, so it can only get out to the internet, it cannot go out uh, and look at local network. And then we have the Avahi, Avai, Avai protocol. I've done a video on this before I get the naming uh, possibly wrong, and MDNS, because some people have messaged me with concerns when I did that video saying, but doesn't that break the security model? No, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about real quick here. So the reason with IoT devices, you may want them on a separate network, is if they become compromised, they become attack vectors. And when someone gets in your network and anything that reaches out through the firewall and listens for commands, which is how most IoT devices work, when they're listening for commands and if they were insecure or poorly designed and someone finds a way to hijack the commands coming into them, and we've seen many devices by lots of random companies come out there, get to market, but not really have any security auditing done until they were deployed in a market, which is what's created many of these IoT botnets. These devices, once hijacked, they start looking for other things to hijack. Now, many of them simply go back out to the internet to you know, go back to attacking things or whatever their purpose that they were set forth to do becomes, but you don't want that to be you or something local on your network. Now, in theory, if your computer's patched, it should be safe from said things, but you still don't really want them making noise on your network, so we put them on a separate network. Now, I have a couple devices listed here, like the Chromecast or the Amazon Dot. Either one of those are statistically less likely to be attack vectors because both Google and Amazon have a pretty good security reputation. But lots of people get those off-brand uh, random tablets and things like that or random friends coming over with their phones that maybe they sideloaded something and maybe has, has a security compromise on it that you don't know about and it's looking for things to start talking to. Or as I have a screenshot from our friends over at Silicon Valley, the wonderful the refrigerators that for some reason need to be connected to the internet and you know maybe the company's really good at designing refrigerators but maybe not so good at designing security related to those refrigerators and your refrigerator becomes in a potential attack point and you don't want it wandering around so the reason i mentioned evi protocol is some of these devices require talking to your local devices to get them to function fully and Chromecast specifically is one of them that I believe some of the Apple AirPlay stuff does, and I think Sonos and a handful of other devices, they use this protocol referred to as MDNS. And by loading up the Avi protocol, it maintains the MDNS lookup. Now first, let's talk about how the rule sets work here again. Anything on the dot three network here, full access to the internet and has access to these devices. And this sometimes causes confusion. By allowing the three network to talk to the 172 network, that means you requested from your side of the network, and specifically 3.9 is the IP address of my computer. If I go in and make a request to a device on this side, I'm the one that initiated the request and will only send back data based on my request for data. But these on this side here cannot initiate a request or even have awareness of the 192 network. So anything on the 172 network, if it scans its local network, it may find the other things on this IoT network, but it doesn't have any ability to reach out to any other private addresses in the 192 space. 
because we have them blocked. And we'll get into the rules real quick, uh, how I have them set up in a second. Now, this is also where we need the Avi DNS because the Chromecast wants to talk to the phone. And if the phone is on a separate network, it doesn't see it. Now, what MDNS is, is a protocol that allows DNS lookups, specific type of DNS lookups. You can look up the RFC spec and just Google MDNS and read into the details of it. That doesn't break the security model because it's only publishing lists. Now, this list then gets maintained on both sides of the network. So things on this network can do a call, give me the MDNS list of devices that support these protocols. The MDNS list has it and the Chromecast will be listed in there and Avaya running maintains that list. So you are still doing from a security model an initiated connection from here to talk to here where the initiation is starting on the 192 network and then requesting something over on the 172 network. In the case of Chromecast, you would be opening up maybe the YouTube app. You select the Chromecast app and you say, hey, YouTube will then speak to that device and tell it, go get this YouTube video and display it on that Chromecast. So this is where the confusion came in because some people think, well, if it publishes the IP addresses of these things, doesn't that break the security? Well, no, the firewall rules maintain the separation between these devices. And with MDNS, it's not really talking back to the phone. It, it's just giving it the feedback the phone requested via that app. So it's not giving, even with the initiated connection, some type of massive back access to it. Now, if somehow you had a device that was MDNS and an app that controlled it, you could potentially have an issue if there was some exploit both in the app, the methodology, and if it requested something, was able to send something back. It's a real edge case, and if you're that worried about security, you wouldn't have any of these devices on your network, and you wouldn't be trying to use Chromecast or any of those devices. Now, the other thing that would go on this network, let's say, would be things like garage door openers and other random IoT light switches and stuff like that. But most of those don't even need any type of MDNS look because they don't look locally for the network. The methodology that they connect with is they contact wherever their host server is as a service. For example, I've seen a few garage door companies that use an Amazon EC2 cloud instance. They contact that. So you get them, you set them up, you go to their portal, whatever that portal may be, and it talks to that portal in the Amazon cloud. Then what your phone does when you load up the app for that garage door opener, it talks to the Amazon portal. And because the two devices don't ever have to be on the same network, there's nothing you really need to do on here, you can have them on a separate network and have these same rules and it doesn't break anything at all. This is actually how many, many cloud devices work. They don't wanna deal with trying to figure out local IP addresses and things like that. Um, the ones that do are gonna use probably MDNS. So there's never really any port mapping that needs to occur between these. Um, unless you try to get complicated and put a printer over here, you'd have to map the ports of the printer between the firewall and the local network to get it on here. I would usually recommend people not do that because it creates, it can be done, but you're going to create a more complicated network for yourself because there's a lot of things that need to go on back and forth with them because they kind of expect to be on the same network, especially with wireless printers. But once again, are wireless printers a threat model? Yeah, unfortunately, we found some security flaws in them. I generally recommend commercial printers like directly plugged in because they're going to be better. Take that for what it's worth. That is just kind of a risk of having the printers in there if the printer goes out and wants to talk to the cloud. Some wireless printers are simpler, um, and I don't know every model of them that you can just keep them on your local network and they don't need to call out, or you can just plug them in USB and mitigate the potential for some of those issues. All right, now let's actually dig into the rules of what this looks like. Now, the first thing I wanna show you is the AVHI uh, daemon, AVI daemon, and it's really simple. Enable the VI, LAN, and IoT for the sake of this discussion. Uh, that's how we're going to be doing this. Don't worry about the other networks. We have several other things for other purposes, but I want devices on LAN to be able to talk to via MDNS devices on IoT. Check a few boxes here, pretty straightforward, no advanced settings in here, hit save. And that's what bridges that MDNS across those devices. Once again, you're not changing any firewall rules. You're not allowing the passing of any traffic. It's basically like publishing a DNS list and listening on both sides with the DNS to make a list, but no actual traffic is going back and forth related to this. It's just a listing service that lists DNS entries. Next, private networks versus public networks. I labeled this called 
LTS private networks. LTS underscore private underscore networks. Description, our private network list. Type networks. And you find this under aliases in the firewall. The nice thing about aliases, because I have three different networks, I don't want anything on the IoT network to be able to come back and talk to it all. And they're cleverly named dot three dot two and VPN. There's the networks right here. So let's talk about the rule now. So we've created this little alias. Now, if you only have two networks, you could forego this and only type in the IP address as a destination like this. And we're going to show you both ways to write this rule. So here's what the rule looks like. One rule that says source is IoT net. So source is the IoT network, the 172 network we talked about. And from that source network, where are we allowed to go? What's the destination? So if you were to add the rule as wide open, asterisk is basically wide open, it would be able to go anywhere else on the network. You have to have at least one rule in here to allow the traffic to route. We're saying not wide open, so uh, anything in the IP4, IPv4 protocol space, source IoT network, port, asterisk, any port, destination, if you notice a little exclamation point ahead of this, and we mouse over it, we see our alias. It's saying, hey, exclamation point, not these. And I just refer to the rule in my description, allow all except, which means allow all networks except this one. So we're going to go over here now and show you how that works. Single host or alias, LTS private networks, invert match. Simple. The invert is really important because if we didn't invert this, it would do exactly the opposite of what we want. It wouldn't allow it on the internet. It would allow it to my private networks, and we definitely don't want it there. Now, if you didn't want to write the alias, you could put 192.168.0, single host or alias, I believe... There we go. You have to choose network if you want it to be a network destination. So 3.0/24 if I only wanted to block the one network, but like I said, I prefer to do this as an alias. So we're going to say single host or alias. Delete. I just typed the first letter. LTS. Here's our description, allow all. And that's it for the rules. Hit save. And now the IoT devices can't get back to me, but I can get to them. And quick demo to show you how that works. All right, now that we've seen the rules, I have a Debian server sitting at the 172.16.69 address, slash 24, and my computer is 192.168.3.9, as shown here. And I'm SSH'd in, and what this is is PFTOP, and we filtered for host 172.16.69.39 because we want to see what this host can see and show you how the rules work in action. So if I request an ICMP packet from 172.16.69.39, we now see 3.9 getting data over to here. Traffic type is ICMP, as you can see right here. So no problem. Now, and this is, like I said, the part I wanted to make sure people are clear on. So if we try to ping 192.168.3.9, nothing. Dead air. The firewall will not allow an established connection from there. So this is that little part of confusion that I just wanted to make sure it cleared up with people. Um, when you're getting into networking, they assume if a connection is made one way, that automatically means something can be back. So the firewall prevents, based on the rules, a connection from coming back. So I can still ping this, but that still doesn't allow it because my computer didn't request data. So here's that ICMP rule, it's gonna expire. Here's the one up here, no data traverses because of the firewall rule. But up to the top here, if we ping news.com, I can ping out, I can get out to the internet and you can follow what happened here. We have an ICMP packet, we have a UDP packet because it had to do a lookup, port 53 to figure out the name of the address I wanted to ping, and now it's sending data, so it has access to the internet, but it doesn't have access to the local network. So, you know, these are the simple rules that you put it on there. It doesn't have to be that complicated. That one rule with an invert in there saying, don't go to my private network, just go out to the internet and do your IoT thing, and hopefully you don't get attacked, um, and hopefully you don't get compromised. 
and away you go. Now this also expands it so if later you decide to do things like rate limit or speed limit that particular leg of the network, you could do that. You could put in a rule that says my IoT network can never have much bandwidth because you don't want it to take away. That's also a good way to do this so you don't take away from your main network bandwidth. That's another concept you can do. It's not hard to do when you apply some of the rules. But just in general, it, they're usually not bandwidth hogs, and well, except for things like Chromecast that by their nature, if you're watching Netflix at 4K, going to use some bandwidth. Um, but this allows you to have them on a separate network where you can worry about them a little bit less, but you can still get to them to make things function like the Chromecast using the Avi protocol via MDNS. So hopefully this concept uh, makes sense to you. And it's just, like I said, a real basic overview. And if you want to know in depth more walk through step by step my getting started with pf sense video which i'll throw a link to that will get you started from loading it to creating these network rules step by step all the way through i've also got several ones on unify of how to line up vlans with pf sense it's pretty straightforward to do um and always hopefully this was helpful or enlightening to get you a little bit better understanding of what the risk might be for having an iot stuff and why you might want to just keep it on another network and how simple it is to do that and still maintain functionality not too big of a deal all right thanks thanks for watching if you enjoyed this video go ahead and hit the thumbs up if you want to see more content from my channel go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell icon and hopefully youtube will send you a notice if you're interested in contracting lawrence systems for any type of it services work or consulting work go ahead and head over to lawrencesystems.com and fill out our contact and get in touch with us if you would like to help the channel out in other ways, you can use our affiliate links below in the description, or we have a link directly to our Lawrence Systems page where we have a list of different affiliate offers, and it's very appreciated if you use any of those for signing up any of the services, and many of them offer you discounts. If you want to head over to our forums, there'll be a link in the description for our forums, uh, wherever they may be, because we've been looking at different forum platforms, but they'll always be relevantly linked right there. All right, once again, thanks. Leave some feedback and comments below on this video. If you loved it, if you hated it, I try to reply to everyone, the people who hate and the people who love them. So thank you very much and see you next time.